Hello everyone, welcome back and in today's video, we're going to be covering a problem uh, which deals with the motion of a bead along a uniform helix. So we're going to be solving problem number 29 in this video and problem number 30, I'll give you guys as homework and these two problems are exactly identical. So if you're, if you understand problem 29, then problem number 30 is going to be very easy. With that, let's just jump straight into the theory that we need to solve this problem. So let's say the radii of the cylinder is capital R and the pitch of the helix is P. Okay, so now how do we obtain helical motion? So so let's say we have a particle, something like this, that is performing simply circular motion, uh, whose angular velocity of revolution is omega. So its speed is simply r omega, right? If to this particle over here, we give an additional uniform velocity, the path it follows is going to be that of a helix. So that's the main concept here. So we are basically giving this circular motion velocity, a vertical velocity, let's, let's call the vertical direction as the z direction. We're giving it a z axis, z direction velocity, and that's what results in a uniform helical motion. And in one time period of revolution of the circular motion, the vertical distance that this particle descends by is what we call as the pitch. And for a uniform helix, the pitch is constant, even though in the diagram I made, it doesn't look as such. For a, for a uniform cylindrical helix, the pitch is constant and we can easily determine the pitch. So uh, we know that the time period of one revolution is nothing but two pi by omega for one circular revolution. So in this particular time, let's just assume the vertical velocity of the particle is V. So the distance covered in the Z direction is what we define as the pitch. And this is going to be two pi by omega, which is the time taken multiplied by the velocity. After every circular motion revolution, the particle descends by a vertical distance of P. Okay, that's what we define as the pitch. So from here, we can also discuss about the acceleration. So acceleration is essentially the rate of change of the velocity vector. So if you observe something guys, this V vector is not changing in magnitude or in direction. Right? So there is no acceleration in this particular direction. Whereas the r omega vector, it's actually changing its direction, right? And we know that for a circular motion, the, the acceleration is going to be towards the center of the circle and its magnitude is going to be r omega squared. And therefore we can say at any particular point on the helix, the acceleration is going to be r omega squared and it is going to be passing through the center of the circular motion. Okay guys, so now I've discussed all this stuff in a video that I'm going to be linking right now. In that video, I have covered it in a bit more detail. So if you guys want more detail to all this stuff, then you can go to that video, okay? And in that video, I've also covered another really good check your understanding problem. So make sure to check that video out as well. Okay, so the next thing we have to discuss here is the path length. So let's say we release a bead somewhere over here and the bead travels along the helical path and it reaches some point two over here, okay? some arbitrary point. And the only information given is that the Z coordinate difference between point one and two is H. If you look at it from the top, it is going to perform circular motion, right? The total circular motion angle covered to go from one to two is given to be theta. So the total angle covered is given to be theta. So these are the two only informations that are given. So with that, we have to determine length of the physical path that the particle travels from one to two. Okay guys, so in order to determine this, first, uh, first we have to analyze a differential element. Let's take a small displacement vector. Let's call this vector as DL. And let's say we draw the DL element zoomed in. So it'll have two components, guys. One is along the Z cap direction. Let's just call it as DZ. And one component, which is going to be in the horizontal plane. This horizontal displacement, we can uh, say that it is because of the circular motion and the vertical displacement is because of the translational velocity V. If you observe the circular motion, this distance, this displacement over here, we can actually just write it as, if I call this angle as d theta, this displacement, I can write it as r d theta. This displacement as r d theta. Now guys, if I draw one more triangle, uh, representing the velocity. So now we know that the velocity vector is nothing but the rate of change of the displacement vector. So the velocity is in the direction of the displacement. Okay, so I can also represent these as their individual velocities. It's also similar to, you know, just dividing all these by dt. So, so in the triangle, if this side represents a net speed, this side represents r omega, and this side represents the vertical ascent velocity of v. So now uh, let's say guys, I represent this angle as theta. Okay, so from this triangle, uh, we can see that theta will actually remain constant. The reason for that is for a uniform helix, v and r omega is constant, right? So you can take up the dl elements at any particular point, uh, always this angle theta is going to be constant. So that's something that is very important. Now with this, we can actually do a very interesting thing. So what I'm gonna do here is now guys, uh, I'm gonna take up this path length over here which is a coiled wire, right? So I'm gonna take it, stretch it out into a straight wire, 
and place it along the hypotenuse of this right triangle okay and now i'm going to make, make a claim here even this angle is going to be theta the same theta that we determined over here and this side over here is nothing but h and this side is nothing but r theta so now i'll explain why i wrote it this way a really obvious thing if i take up small small dl elements along the path and i sum all these dl elements up then what i obtain is l okay so now let's say we take a small dl element on this length l okay so we know that the dl makes an angle of theta with the horizontal from this triangle over here so this side length represents rd theta and this side length represents dz so now if you observe all such dl elements what you observe is that their horizontal rd thetas when added up simply gives us r theta and similarly their individual dz terms when added up gives us the total height difference between point 0.1 and point 0.2 and that's why we can actually re represent them in this triangle over here. I have also covered this, uh, in the other video that I told you guys to watch. Now this makes the calculation so much more easier. From here we can directly get the path length as square root of h squared plus r theta squared. And therefore if let's say they give you the question, NAN starts from point 0.1 to point 0.2 and its speed is v, what is the time taken? So then you can do L divided by v to get the answer. Okay, so now um, coming up to one more important thing, consider this point 3 over here guys. So we know in one, one revolution, or after covering two pi radians, the particle will go from point one to point three. And we know that it will descend a distance of P. So now if I draw a right triangle for that, then I can say this is path from one to three. The vertical height descended is nothing but the pitch of the helix. And this is nothing but r theta. So for one revolution, the, uh, the angle is two pi. So this is going to be two pi r. And from here, from this triangle, we get an important relation that is tan theta equals P divided by two pi r. So now we are going to discuss how to discuss the radii of curvature of the helix. So for this, we are going to borrow the same diagram that we drew above and we're going to observe this point over here. Let's call it as point P. And the reason for that is it's easier to visualize because at this particular point, if I want to write the net velocity, it will have a component V in the downward direction and R omega into the plane, right? And we also know the acceleration. So for that, all you have to do is draw this horizontal plane circular motion of this particle. And we know the acceleration is towards the center of this circle, right? And we know the magnitude of the acceleration is nothing but r omega square. In order to determine the radii of curvature, now what we need is the net speed squared divided by the normal acceleration. And if you observe the net velocity, which is the resultant of this r omega and v, will lie in this vertical plane, which is clearly perpendicular to the acceleration, right? So the acceleration is clearly in this direction, which is perpendicular to this plane. So A normal is simply this itself, R omega square. And the net speed you can easily obtain by doing square root of V square plus R omega square. There's a slightly more interesting result. So if you observe things from this side over here, then you'll observe R omega to the right, V in the downward direction, and obviously the net speed uh, in this direction. And as we discussed above, the net speed makes an angle of theta with the horizontal plane. So from here, we can actually write the net speed as r omega divided by cos theta from this triangle. So this thing squared divided by uh, r omega squared. So from here, we get, the, we get the radii of curvature of a uniform helix as r capital R divided by cos square theta. This is a convenient way of remembering the radii of curvature of the helix. So the last question of the MCQ section in Pathfinder was to find out the radii of helix. So in that question, they took the pitch of the helix as H uh, and asked us the radii of curvature. For that, all you have to do is use the triangle. Cos, one by cos squared is secant squared. Secant squared, I can write it as one plus tan squared. Observing our important triangle over here, from here we can see that tan theta is nothing but P divided by two pi R. So this is going to be the, uh, the pitch divided by two pi R squared. So from here, we get the radii of the helix as capital R plus h square divided by four pi square r. So this is the answer to that Pathfinder problem. So now we have discussed everything that we need. Now we can finally discuss our problem. Okay guys, so now in problem 29, so basically we have a frictionless rigid helical wire frame. Axis of the helix is vertical, which means gravity is acting downwards. Radius is capital R, pitch is h. Now the question is, in how much time will the beat descend a height capital H? Okay, and capital H is not equal to H guys, it's some random H. So let's say the particle starts from over here and let's say this is the point that finally it reaches and the height difference between these two points are given to be capital H. Okay, so now obviously if we want to figure out the time, then we need the acceleration, right? For acceleration, again, what we are going to do is take a small element in the helical path. Let's call it as DL. 
zoom the image and draw it over here. So now from our previous discussions, uh, I told you guys DL always makes an angle of theta with the horizontal plane. And this is where our result is going to be very useful. So imagine the bead is somewhere over here. So now we can easily write its acceleration along the plane as G sine theta, right? Because uh, for each DL elements, the angle theta is always going to be fixed. So the acceleration is fixed. It is going to be G sine theta, just like in a inclined plane motion. So the time to reach from, let's call this point as one, this point as two. So the time to reach from one to two is going to be square root of two times L12 divided by uh, G sine theta. Simple kinematic results. So now all we have to do is determine L12 and that we can determine using our triangle. So this height is given to be capital H. This is L12. So L12 from this triangle is H divided by sine theta. And for determining sine theta, we'll use, use the pitch triangle, right? So if this angle is theta, this is the pitch. This is 2 pi r and from here we obtain sine theta as h divided by square root of h squared plus 4 pi squared r squared. So now once you substitute the value of sine theta and L12, you'll obtain the time taken to go from point 0.1 to 2 as this particular value. Second question is more interesting. We have to find the force the wireframe exert on the bead when the bead has descended descended a height edge. So basically the bead is now over here. So it, it would have obviously gained some velocity. So in this case, we have to find the force on the bead. The motivation to problem 30 is based on this question over here. Okay, so now obviously there is no friction acting on the bead at any particular point. The only force that is doing any useful work is gravity. And we can easily write the work done by gravity as mgh, right? So this has to be equal to the change in kinetic energy half mv squared which means we can say the speed is nothing but square root of 2g capital H. So now we have finally determined the speed of the particle when it reaches the point two. So now let's zoom in at point two. So let's say this is a DL element at the point two. The tricky part in this problem is that let's say if the bead is somewhere over here, it's actually at point two at this moment. So obviously there will be normal force acting on this bead. Let's call it N. And N will obviously be equal to mg cos theta. Theta, we know this angle is theta. So N is going to be mg cos theta. But this is not the answer. And the reason for that is this is not the only normal force that is acting on this and the second normal is that if you observe it from the top view then we know that in the horizontal plane it is actually performing a circular motion and we know that the acceleration of the circular motion is nothing but v perpendicular squared divided by capital R where v perpendicular is the velocity of the circular motion that we discussed. The only force that can give this acceleration is the normal force so there will be one normal in this direction as well n2 and we have to take into account this normal as well uh, you know depict it in this diagram itself so there will be one more normal that is going to be into the plane let's call it as n2 and the inter and the acceleration in the inward direction guys it is is going to be v perpendicular squared divided by r where v perpendicular is this component if you remember it's, it's the per, a component of velocity in the horizontal plane so if this angle is theta then v perpendicular is nothing but v cos theta now there are two ways to write this you can either write the normal acceleration as the net speed squared divided by the radii of curvature of the helix or you can write it as the v perpendicular squared divided by r r is the radius of the cylinder and both will actually give you the same answer so from here n2 comes out to be the mass times the acceleration v perpendicular is v cos theta so this is going to be v cos theta squared divided by so after using mb perpendicular squared divided by r this is the value of n2 that you get so now the net normal is going to be the resultant of these two and now as you can see these two are perpendicular to each other so this is simply going to be square root of n square plus n2 squared so now from here obviously i can take m cos theta outside so this is what we are getting in now in order to replace cos theta we are going to use the pitch triangle where this angle is theta this is h this is 2 pi r. So now of taking the common terms outside and rearranging the terms, this is what you obtain for the net normal reaction. Okay, and in the next problem, now in the homework problem, guys, the thing that you have to keep in mind is there is kinetic friction as well. Okay, obviously you, you, can, you can write the kinetic friction as mu n, but keep in mind the n is the net normal. Right, so that's the hint for the problem. If you guys understood problem number 29, then problem number 30 should also be pretty easy. And you can match this, then this is simply the check your understanding problem 30 in Pathfinder. So after solving, try matching it with that question. Okay guys, so uh, I mean, I took this problem from the AITS because I thought this was a bit different. I think it's the exact problem that we solved, but you can try out this problem as well. If something looks different in the options. You can try this out as well. And after trying it out, just drop the answers in the comment section. So I'll just respond to it. So yeah, that was it for this problem, guys. If you have any doubts, you can comment down below. And that's it. Thanks for watching.